Actually, one of the first Japanese uh, live-action films that I English dubbed was a Japanese zombie movie, horror movie called Zombrex Dead Rising Sun for Capcom and Kiji Inafune, the guy who created Mega Man. And that was a very interesting film. It was sort of a 1980s slasher, zombie, gory movie, and we English dubbed that one. Uh, a couple other anime things that happened were uh, we did an episode of Free Eternal Summer. Free is a, about a high school swim team. And they had an episode where they went to Australia, and they actually recorded Australian voices. So Winkler Productions, we were hired to do the episode for all the English dialogue, and <clears throat> I did one of the voices of the Australians. But we had real Australian people living and working in Hollywood doing voices for that. And we sent the tracks to Japan. I was working with storyboards, so we, there was no anime that was dubbed. I mean, it was all storyboards that we were working to, and then they animated it afterwards, you know. We also did a movie, a great kids' film called Eden. It was sort of like a Madagascar type of film that for production read. I did a lot of work with production read. Uh, I did some distribution. I'm not usually a distributor, but I did some distribution for Minky Momo, which was their famous series. And uh, Eden was uh, just a very wonderful children's animated film, kind of a Disney-ish type of movie with an environmental theme. Here's a funny bit of trivia. When they were casting the very first original Power Rangers, the ones that went, the show that ultimately went on the air, they called me and aggressively were pursuing me. They wanted me to audition to play one of those lead rangers. And, I mean, seriously, the, they called me and they, were, they wanted me to come in. I said no, I wouldn't do it because it was a non-union show. It was non-union and I was, I was a member of SAG and AFTRA. And so I didn't do it. But I... I had a very good opportunity. I had a, I think I had a very good chance that I might have been one of those original Rangers had I said yes. But that's okay because fate turned out that I got to do all these voices in anime and I got to be the voice of Ultraman X as well as Ultraman Taro in one of the other films which was a different different voice. Another funny bit that I did was I played a a soldier in an episode of China Beach. And the girls in that television series, it was a kind of a famous series, China Beach. And uh, the girls were putting on a fashion show in this episode. And the director said to us, you guys are all horny soldiers. And go crazy for these girls doing the fashion shows and everything else. And she t he told me to grab Dana Delaney, who was the star and sexy girl at the time, to grab Dana's beautiful behind, which I did. And I loved, as you would come by, I'd grab her butt. So the entire, and he loved, he said, do more, do more. He really loved what I was doing. So anyway, I got to, I got paid to spend an afternoon grabbing Dana Delaney's gorgeous derriere. <laughs> One of the most bizarre series that I ever worked on, and I mean, people cannot believe it to this day that I did this. I wrote, produced, and directed, co-directed, a comedy variety television series that aired in Los Angeles for 13 weeks called Short Ribs that starred famous little actor Billy Barty <laughs> and Patty Maloney and Jimmy Briscoe. It was like Saturday Night Live with an entire cast of little people, midgets and dwarves. Uh, Billy Barty was the executive producer and, I guess, creator of the show. I was the main writer and, and, and producer on the show. But to be honest with you, I wound up writing most of the shows. <clears throat> and it was like, again, like Saturday Night Live with little people. But it was unbelievable. It was just the most disastrous thing. We were, we were a year before in living color, but instead of African-American cast, it was all little people. And I found Billy Barty to be so hard to work with, so difficult to work with. 
and uh, you know my scripts would be rewritten. So the comedy, you know, the in comedy you have a you have the setup and then the punchline. Either the setup was fouled up, or the punchline was fouled up. And sometimes Barty used cue cards instead of memorizing the lines. So, you know, Robin Williams was great at improvisation, but I didn't believe that Billy Barty was a Robin Williams in improvisation. And so. The show has this most incredible nightmarish quality to it. It was, it, it's the most bizarre thing you'd ever seen. There'd be spoofs of television shows and commercials. It was sponsored by 7-Up, and 7-Up sponsored the show. And it aired uh, primetime Saturday nights, 8.30 to 9 here in L.A., and then later it was syndicated. But it was, you got to see it to believe it, you know. Um, it, it was just... My, it was an it was it was an absolute disaster, really. But now let me tell you the funny thing. I'd been owed a little bit of money at the time, and I was very young at that. It was one of the early shows that I did, and Barty didn't pay me. So I kept trying to get him to pay me. He wouldn't pay me, and then sadly, I had to take him to of all places, small claims court. <laughs> now, the AP wire services picked up on this little Billy Barty and small claims court, small Billy Barty, small Billy. There was so much press and publicity and PR. We were on Entertainment Tonight. We were in every newspaper in the country. It, they had a field day with this story. Of course, I won the case and I got my money. But it was the most publicity Billy Barty had ever had in his entire career. And, uh, you know, it was all negative, actually. But it was just, uh, it was such a lost opportunity because something that crazy could have worked and could have been hugely, again, we were a year before in, in Living Color, and it, nothing like it had ever been done. There'd be spoofs of TV shows and commercials and, you know, like the Beverly Hillbillies would be spoofed as the Beverly Hillbilly Barties, you know, and, and there'd be all sorts of child safety products that went wrong, but the little people would be posing as now if this is your child wearing the seat and whatever and it was it it had a I tried to create sort of a Monty Python British humor type of show that was just off the wall and outrageous and Barty seemed to kind of want to do more of a Lawrence Welk type of show and it we clashed you know and you know after the show got canceled my father had died of cancer and it was a very very rough time for me and what he did with that whole situation and the lawsuit and everything else was just really despicable, you know. He's, he's lo the weirdest story, true story, when Barty passed away, I didn't know he'd passed away, but I, I swear this is truth. I woke up having had a nightmare, and the nightmare was there was a little screaming demon in a hot rod screaming down the hill and it was on fire and then I swear to God I woke up and it was like a scary nightmare I thought what the hell is that and I thought was that Barty or something the next morning on the news I found out that Barty died and that's a true story so is that crazy he said Willie when you're hired to act in a piece of shit, you must think of it as wonderful material that you love doing. 